Today is January the 31st of 2012, last day of the month. And a little bit earlier today, I was on av1611.org, um, Dial the Truth Ministries, and I saw this article, and I just I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And it's interesting because I printed it out, and as I was sitting there reading it, I looked up quick and I checked my email, and a pastor, uh, Pastor uh, Dan, uh, boy, I can't think of his last name right now, the, he's a pastor out in Michigan, Gateway Anabaptist Church, he actually sent me a link to this article, and he's like, you got to check this out, it's unreal. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a WorldNet Daily exclusive. New Bible Yanks Father, Jesus as Son of God. Islam Sensitive Project Ignites Controversy Online Petition. And this is by Joel Richardson. And uh, you aren't going to believe what's in this article here. And let me just state before I read this article, and I have links to it there. You can go check it out for yourself. But uh, this ministry here, Bible Believers Fellowship, we are what's called King James only. A lot of people don't understand that. And they, they kind of consider us as heretics or some kind of thing like this. Uh, no, quite quite on the contrary. We are not the heretics. Uh, we stand for the King James Bible being the only modern-day Receptus Bible, Textus Receptus Bible, based on the majority of Greek manuscripts. Uh, we are not a bunch of dumb bunnies that don't have any kind of support for our stand. Okay, We stand for the Bible that Christians have used down through the centuries. And we have been warning for a very long time those of us who are King James only, that the new versions are part of a satanic conspiracy to get rid of the Word of God. And, of course, we were laughed at years ago when we would warn about the Vatican's uh, manuscripts, Greek texts, the mi minority text, less than 1% of extant Greek manuscripts. You know, we would come out, we would say, this is wrong, it's it's bad. One of the, the probably the main manuscript that's used behind that underlies these new versions is Codex B, known as the Vaticanus. Some say Vaticanus or something, but I say Vaticanus. I want people to know where it came from. And that is commonly represented today by the United Bible Societies and Nestle's 27th edition Greek text. And the Nestle's 27th edition Greek text, I have a copy, and it says right in the foreword, that this text is made under the supervision of the Vatican. And one of the men that sits on the board of editors is Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini. He is a Jesuit cardinal. I mean, it's... You can check out the video, The Real Bible Version Issue Exposed, if you want more information. That's a video that I produced a couple years ago now, actually. You can see it online for free at, at YouTube. But my point is... We warned about this Vatican-inspired text replacing the King James Bible and the text that underlies the King James Bible, and we warned about it for years and years and years. And you know there was debate over Luke 2:33 and 1 Timothy 3:16 and all these different passages in Acts 8:37, Mark 9:44 and 46, you know that have been taken out because they don't appear in these Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. And, you know, there was a lot of debate back and forth, but in recent years we've been seeing that these new versions are actually departing from that Alexandrian text, that Nestle's and United Bible Society's text. Why? Well, to appease the feminists. And they're actually putting words, adding words and subtracting and changing words to appease the feminists. And now they're going one step further, and it is these people, it's not some group of ultra-liberal radical neo-orthodox unitarian some kind of heretical thing it's the people who worked on introducing that alexandrian that minority text to the body of christ it's those same people now that are coming out with this new ultra heresy this new i mean just you talk about a doctrine of devils this thing goes way beyond that but let's get into the article here, and you'll see why I'm so worked up about this. Okay, starting out here, the article 
says, In the world of questionable and sometimes downright silly Bible translation translations, one would think that it couldn't get any worse. After all, we've seen the, quote, In the beginning, Big Daddy created the heaven and the earth, Ebonics Bible, as well as the Apostles' Log Star Trek English Paraphrase Bible. In a more serious effort, the new Oxford Annotated Bible was created in part by pro-gay and feminist scholars in order to set forth a more gay revisionist interpretation of Scripture. Now what you have there is you just have a lost world that's messing with God's Word. That's all there is to it. They're not Christians that are putting this garbage out. But continuing here, it says, But now there is a major controversy developing as the latest altered Bibles are being created by organizations that most would think of as being more conservative and reasonable. At the forefront of the controversy are the Wycliffe Bible Translators, the Sum Summer Institute of Linguistics and Frontiers, all of which are producing Bible translations that remove or modify terms which they have deemed offensive to Muslims. Now, many years ago, I was reading a book about some missionaries that went down to South America, and they were working with Wycliffe Bible translators. And this is probably 1950s, 1960s, on right around in there. And they were trying to make a translation for these people that lived down in the Amazon jungle. And they were doing this thing of, well, we're going to have to change some of the words because these poor, foolish, you know, people in the jungle, they couldn't possibly understand things. Like they, I remember the one was, they couldn't understand the word lukewarm. So they had to come up with a brand new word. Something that, you know, they had a word, in other words, in their language, but they, they said, we got to come up with some kind of a new thing. We'll change the text so that it can the, they can understand it. And I remember I heard another one where they were saying about how that they've never seen sheep, but they have seen pigs, so we'll just say pig instead of sheep. You know, and the thought kind of went through my head. I, I was thinking, couldn't you just get a picture and show them the picture? This is a sheep, you know. I mean, so what what they're doing what Wycliffe Bible Translators has been doing for many many years here in America they act all holy and pious but then they go over to other countries and they just pervert and destroy the scriptures and then they come back here to America and they say oh the fine people there in the jungle these heathen people they now have the word of God in their own language and what are they doing they're getting people's money and you're going to see a little bit later that I'm right in what I'm saying but continuing back to the article here, it says, That's right, Muslim-friendly Bibles. Included in the controversial development is the removal of any references to God as Father, to Jesus as the Son or the Son of God. Islam does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or that God was his Father. But back to the article, it says, One example of such a change can be seen in an Arabic version of the Gospel of Matthew, produced and promoted by Frontiers and SIL. It changes Matthew 28:19 from this, quote, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to this, quote, cleanse them by water in the name of Allah, his Messiah and his Spirit and his Holy Spirit, excuse me. A large number of such Muslim sensitive translations already are published and well circulated in several Muslim majority nations such as Bangladesh, Indonesia and Malaysia. According to Joshua Lingle of I2 Ministries, even more dramatic a change is the Arabic and Bangla, which is Bangladesh, translations. In Arabic, Bible translations err by translating Father as Lord, Guardian, Most High, and God. In Bangla, Son of God is mistranslated Messiah of God, consistent with the Quran's Isa al-Masih, Jesus the Messiah, which references the merely human Jesus. You see... Islam teaches that Jesus is just a prophet. You know, he's not even the greatest prophet. Muhammad was. The dirty, filthy, sex pervert Muhammad. You know, demented lunatic. I mean, it, watch my video, Wacky Islam, if you want some the truth about Muhammad and his weird beliefs and, and that are actually taught in the Quran. But uh, just, you know, they're, they're coming out with these versions and they're changing Jesus from the Son of God to just, well, he's just the Messiah, he's just the prophet, you know, very, very wicked. Back to the article. 
In response to these translations, many within the evangelical missions movement, as well as many former Muslim converts and indigenous Christians from countries where these translations are being used, are indignant. I would hope so. After numerous appeals have been rejected, a petition has been launched to call for the end to these translations. More than 3,000 already have signed up. While the organizations that are promoting these translations are adamant that replacing such terms as Father with Lord or Master best conveys the inspired meaning of the text, many of the indigenous Christian leaders from the countries where these translations are being promoted are broadly rejecting the translations. Now, something that was just written there in that article, it says that they, they, we best convey the inspired meaning of the text. Now, what's going on here? A lot of these New Version scholars, they deem themselves so intelligent and so superior to us foolish laity down here that they say, well, we're going to give you more than a word-for-word -word translation. There's actually New Versions that say that. We want to give you more than word-for-word. -word. You know, the word translate basically means that you are moving something from one area to another. So it is with language you move from Greek and Hebrew, you move it to English. You translate it. Now the idea is that you get it from one point to another with as few changes as possible. God doesn't want his words being changed and, you know, will tell you what the meaning was. God doesn't want that. It'd be very similar somebody saying, I want you to have a brand new car, but I'm going to have Brian come and pick up this car and drive it over to your house. He'll deliver it for you. And the car gets, I get there and I pull in and you come out and the windshield's missing and, and in its place I have a, uh, you know, a piece of plastic and the seats are gone and I have lawn chairs screwed to the floor and one of the tires has been replaced with a, a wagon wheel or something. And you say, what did you do? You know, what, what did you do to my car, my new car? And I say, well, you know, I, I kind of improved it. I, see, I, I didn't think you would understand all the beauty of, of, you know, the way it was originally. So I decided to give you a better, you know, more than just a, a regular car. Well, you wouldn't say, oh, okay, well, that's wonderful. You know, of course not. You have better sense than that. Well, then why should we, as Christians, accept these people, these translation committees, coming out and saying, we're going to tell you what the meaning, the original meaning was. We're not going to translate word for word. We're going to tell you our thoughts and then write it down and then call it God's holy word. What blasphemy. I mean, just horrible what these people are doing. Uh, but let's continue here. Back to the article. The indigenous believers see the introduction of these American-made translations with which they so strongly disagree as a form of American cultural imperialism or colonialism. This is interesting here. Let's continue. According to Turkish pastor Fikret Bocek, I guess is how you say it, such new translations are, quote, an all-American idea with absolutely no respect for the sacredness of scripture or even of the growing Turkish church. Amen, I totally agree with that. According to the testimony of one leader from a church in Bangladesh, one of the most problematic aspects of this development is that it gives fuel to the often heard Muslim claim that, quote, Christians are liars who change their Bibles to deceive Muslims. Now, you can watch my one video series on YouTube about blaspheming the word of God, and you will actually see two men who were raised, quote-unquote, Christian. They went off to seminary, and they had their faith destroyed in the Word of God, in the Bible, by being introduced to Alexandrian destructive textual criticism, to the concepts of Westcott and Hort and all the other heretics that have come down through the years telling us that our King James Bible is no good. And these two men were both destroyed, one at a Methodist university, I think he even went to Harvard or Yale Divinity School, I'm not sure which one, but the other guy went to Bob Jones University. And now they're both Muslims. Why? Because they went off to a seminary to learn how to preach the Word of God, and when they were there, they were taught that the Word of God is not perfect. So then, what do you base your ministry on? See? And this thing is very, very prominent. Most of the seminaries 
are teaching this very thing right now. But continuing here, it says, Once a Bible translation is well established within any country, the introduction of such radically different translations reinforces the Muslim charge and undermines trust in the Christian community. And it's exactly true. The Muslims are using this argument, you know, oh, you have the one true faith, do you? Jesus is the only way to heaven. Why do you have so many contradicting Bible versions? And they're absolutely right to bring that up. That's a very good point. You see, I, as a King James only advocate, I want unity among the body of Christ. And unity can only be achieved when we have one English translation. That's why the Christian church was so powerful here in America a hundred years ago and on back through. Because we had one English Bible. That's what I want to get back to. Now I realize that you know the apostasy is here, the great falling away that the Bible prophesied. So we're never going to have total revival. But the point is, I want to see unity among Bible-believing Christians. You, it's getting to the point where you can no longer stand for these new versions and the people that are putting them out. But we'll continue here. According to Lingle, who can be contacted at, and then they have his web or his uh, email thing there. The crisis in translation methodology is largely due to a postmodern literary bias that has crept into some translation circles in recent decades. Such translations would seem to demand that the divine author of the Bible change rather than the Muslim reader. Yeah, that's the philosophy of a lot of these new version, perversion translators. But Jesus demanded that many of his listeners change, says Lingle, explaining that instead of demanding that Muslim readers change their understanding of God, these translations seem to convey that God must accommodate the religious prejudices of Muslims. Lingle is also the co-editor of a new book called uh, Chrislam, How Missionaries Are Promoting an Islamized Gospel, which represents the first major response against Muslim-sensitive translations, as well as the larger movement often referred to as the insider movement, or Chrislam. You know, when I first heard about this Chrislam thing, I didn't even take it seriously. I thought, no Christian would fall for this. You know, I mean, Islam and Christianity are so far removed from one another. You know, Christianity is founded by a perfect, sinless man, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. He was, he died on the cross to pay for the sins of man, and he was buried and he rose again the third day, and he ascended up to heaven. He's coming again. You know, what's Muslim or what's Islam? Islam is some dirty sex pervert that came out a couple centuries after Jesus Christ. And he lived and fornicated with multiple different women, including a, I think it was a, like a nine-year-old girl. He went around and killed people. And he, he taught this thing of, of holy jihad going around and murdering people and taking what is theirs if they don't convert. He was a cult leader. And he died and he's buried and he's still dead. And his rotten carcass is over in the ground, over there in the, in the Far East. You know, it's not even close. And so I heard this thing, oh, Chrislam, we need to bring them together. And I didn't even take it serious. But it's really starting to grow, apparently. Just incredible. But uh, back to the article here. Uh, according to reports of the rough, roughly 200 translation projects Wycliffe SIL linguists have undertaken in Muslim countries, about 30 or 40 remove the terms father and son with reference to God and Jesus. Hmm, why would they be doing a thing like that? Well, let's continue. Lingle's response is quite direct. These projects need to be defunded. Defunded? How about denounced? <laughs> why don't we expose Wycliffe Bible translators for the heretical organization that they are? You, you, let's defund them. I, I haven't given them a cent of money ever because I've known what they are. And they helped with the NIV and, and all these other new versions. You know, I I used to go to a church, a Methodist church, years and years ago, and it was a very big Wycliffe church. You know, they had all, a lot of Wycliffe missionaries going there. And that church had all kinds of problems, too, by the way. Back to the article. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Yet, according to a recent Forbes 200 Largest U.S. Charities report, the Orlando-based Wycliffe Bible Translators USA is the third most well-funded religious charity in the States. 
Hmm, what a coincidence. What a coincidence that they're coming out with these new versions all the time to appease everybody, and they're making more money than... They're the third most high-paid, the highest dollar religious charity in the United States. What an interesting little coincidence. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I'm going to tell you something. The many sorrows are going to come upon Wycliffe Bible translators. And I'll tell you, a lot of these people, these people that are involved in this wicked thing of Islamic friendly Bibles, they're not saved. I don't believe for one second that these people are Christians. They're about money. They're about making merchandise of God's holy word. I have another video series, the NIV Money Making Scam. And you can get on there, you can watch that video, and I actually get on their website, and I show you uh, Zondervan, where they were bought out by Harper Collins, which is owned by Fox Television, or the same guy that owns Fox Television, Rupert Murdoch. And it's just money, money, money. And they're, and they're like, we, we have to market a Bible to the college students. Oh, oh, and we need one for the African Americans. And we need one for the women and, and for the hunter and the, and the football fan and the baseball fan and the outdoorsman. And, mm -hmm. you know what it is? It's a huge marketing scheme. Why? There's millions and millions of dollars in it. People are willing to pay for what they think are Bibles. And that's what these big organizations are doing. Back to the article here. Not much more to go. Proponents of the insider movement claim that this method of reaching Muslims is bearing great fruit. Of course they do. Opponents, however, put out the, that the so-called converts within the insider movement remain hidden within their Muslim culture, continue to attend a mosque, pray like a Muslim, acknowledge Muhammad as a prophet, the Quran is inspired and make the Muslim creedal confession known, known as the Shahada. <coughs> Some now claim that there are as many as 300,000 to 1.2 million new insider believers in Bangladesh, but one former insider who left the movement and speaks out in Lingle's Chrislam book reports that the number of insiders couldn't be more than 10,000. According to this source, many of the claims are greatly exaggerated. Look at this so as to bring in more funding from wealthy American missionary organizations. Ah, yeah. The love of money is the root of all evil. King James Bible proven correct again. Back to the article. Other former insiders have reported publicly that many insiders are really Muslims who will do whatever it takes for the jobs and money that are offered by pro-IM ministries to feed their families, Lingle says. Further questioning the funding and support of well-known Christian organizations of this movement, Lingle recounts, I have consulted with the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention on missions and evangelism among Muslims at various times, who stated that there are tens of thousands of Issa al-Mashish Jamats or Jesus congregations in northern Africa. But the number of these Jamats... Uh, call themselves Muslims, do not believe in the Trinity and believe Muhammad is a prophet of God, are they Christians or Muslims? Why talk about them in terms of missionary success? In response to what many Christians see as a heretical movement based on deception, Lingle's I2 Ministries is in the process of completing a video-based university called Mission Muslims World University with 40 of the most experienced professors from around the world teaching courses in Muslim ministries, Islamic studies, Apologetics, Evangelism, and Discipleship. What's it all about? It's all about money. If you haven't figured that out by now, they're seeing that there's a market, an untapped market. And they're saying, well, we can make Muslim-friendly Bibles, and you can read it, and you can continue going to your mosque, and you can continue basically living like a Muslim and denying all the fundamentals of the faith. But we'll just say that you're a Christian, you know, you're a Krizlam, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, absolutely absurd. But see, if you can market... I mean, there's a billion Muslims right now on this planet. And if you can market a Bible that's Muslim-friendly, that's a billion times however much you can get per copy. Whew, man, there's some good money in that. 
You say, oh, they wouldn't make merchandise of God's word, would they? Of course they would. It's interesting. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's exactly what these new version people do. They are changing the word of God into a lie. It's totally what they're doing. I want to read a couple verses of scripture to you here. I'm going to do a little quick little Bible study. I'm going to turn to them so I make sure I'm... Most of these I have memorized, but I just want to make sure that I'm not butchering them. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Some people say, well, is it really that bad to to kind of change the meaning a little bit? Maybe, you know, just make it a little easier to understand? Let's see what the Word of God says. The Bible is the standard. It says here, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You notice there in verse 5 it says, Every word of God is pure. God doesn't want his words being changed. He spent a lot of time, a couple thousand years, putting this book together. Putting his words down on paper so we could have it for us today. Christians had to die for the Textus Receptus line of Bibles, the final one being the King James Bible. The authorized version, if you will. Okay, this is the Word of God. We don't need it to be changed. And I can tell you the difference that it will make in your life if you become a King James Bible believer. Again, if you've heard some of my other messages, you've already heard this, but I'm going to say it one more time for new listeners. I used an NIV for 15 years, and my life was rotten as a Christian. And it really didn't change until I got into the pages of the King James Bible. And, and it wasn't that I just said, well, I'm just going to read the King James Bible and nothing else. I have most of the new versions out in my office. Okay, I look at them all the time. I read them a lot. But I read them from a critical standpoint because I know where they came from. Okay, this King James Bible, I use it and I read it and I believe what I'm reading. I believe this is God's word. I don't change it. I don't correct it. When you hear me preaching or anybody here at Bible Believers Fellowship, you will not hear me refer to Greek or Hebrew and say the word here should be translated this way. I don't do it. God has proved this King James Bible for 400 years now. No Bible in history has been put to the, to the test like this King James Bible. This is God's book. But uh, another verse here, we're going to go to Psalm 107, I'm going to show you a couple of verses here today. People say, well, is it, is it really that bad to change the Word of God? Absolutely. Psalm 107, verse 11 and 12. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor, they fell down, and there was none to help. God will judge a nation when they forsake his word, his written word. It's a very, very serious sin. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Go look at verse 20. It says here, The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfect, perfectly. Wait a second. Did I read the... Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was the right one. Proverbs, or, uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 36. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden, for ye have perverted the words of the living God of the Lord of hosts, our God. Now, isn't that something? Ye have perverted the words of the living God. Just like the Wycliffe Bible translators have done. Jeremiah chapter 26. We're going to read verses 2 through 6. I gotta apologize for the Jeremiah twenty three twenty thing thing there. I, that must be the wrong reference. Um, but it was read, so I, I'll just leave it in. Jeremiah chapter twenty six, verse two through six. It says, "Thus saith the Lord: Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word." 
You see, God was speaking to Jeremiah, and then he said, okay, I want you to translate this. Take it from me to you. Go on out there. The words that I speak unto you diminish not a word. You translate it from what I'm telling you to the people, and you take it exactly word for word. Don't you change it. Verse 3. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil, which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Did it happen? Yes. When Jesus Christ showed up on the earth, Israel was not a nation. They were a nation in captivity. But they were in captivity under the Roman government, and they'd been under captivity for hundreds of years. Why? Because they forsook the Lord and they forsook his word. Guess what's going to come to America? And to the UK, where the King James Bible was translated. Continuing on here, I'll give you a verse in the New Testament here. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. I have some of these verses written in the back of my Bible. That's where I'm getting these from. Uh, it says here, Mark 8, 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know what these Wycliffe Bible translators and the other group there, you know what they really are saying? They're actually saying that they are ashamed of Jesus Christ. We as Christians, we have Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him, but by me, it says there in John fourteen six. But the point is, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. None other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And to go to Muslims and say that Jesus is just a man, just like Muhammad was just a man, and it's God, it's not God, it's Allah. We'll just say, or great God, or some kind of thing like this, that appeals to the Muslims. That's the work of lost people. That's the work of Satan's ministers. We're not dealing with Christian work here. Very, very, very wicked. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Luke chapter 9, and verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Very similar to what we just read there in Mark. But again, you see the thing of Jesus is ashamed of people that pervert his words. John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 48. It says here, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The words that Jesus Christ spoke, and those words were recorded on the pages of Scripture. Your four Gospels is where predominantly the words of Jesus are located. Those words are going to judge these wicked Bible perverters that are changing the word of God into a lie. They will be judged. There is a written standard that they will give an account to. Very serious sin that they are involved in. We were here in 1 Timothy 6 earlier. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. It says here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the, do and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing, disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. I recommend, 
I would, you know what I'd like to see? I would like to see Wycliffe Bible translators declare bankruptcy. Put them out of business. Don't just say, well, we don't prefer that you... Put them out of business. Shut them down. That's what I'd like to see, and I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to pray that the Lord brings his wrath and pours out his fury on Wycliffe Bible translators for perverting the words of God. And people wonder why I call these new versions per-versions. Well, because right there in verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. These new versions are all about money. That's what they're... That's the reason that they're making these new versions. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And look at verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. You know, if these Muslims really wanted to know the truth... They would love and accept this King James Bible. All right, but they're not of God. They are lost. They're on their way to hell. And so that's why they want a perverted new version. That's what it's about. And by the way, that applies too to these translators, these modern translators. If they were of God, they would hear God's word and they wouldn't want to change it. They would understand the serious warnings that I'm reading here in Scripture and they'd say, boy, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change the word of God. No way. I fear God. But they don't. Their God is money. Their God is mammon, as the Bible calls it. Next we're gonna go way back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And we're gonna read verse 2. It says here, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. God does not want his word added to or taken away from, diminished from, as it says there in that verse. Very, very, very serious. Now we're almost at the beginning of the Bible there. Now we're going to go the whole way to the end of the Bible. Probably the most serious warning about perverting scripture. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. It says here, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. I would really hate to be one of those Wycliffe Bible translators. Because I can pretty much guarantee you they have a one-way ticket to hell. And except they repent, you know, totally leave the, that organization. But I would say it's not very likely because they're making a lot of money. Third richest charity in America right now. Just a bunch of hell-bound sinners. Wicked, dirty, rotten. I mean, oh man. Really, really, really bothers me. That they would pervert the word of God that way to appeal to Muslims. Of all people, Muslims. Proverbs chapter 13, 13. This is the last one we're going to read. It says here, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. You know, there's an old statement that says, If you mess with God's book, God will mess with you. And I have seen that thing time and time again. I have had dealings with Christians that uh, they start messing with the King James Bible. The one guy had a heart attack. Another guy, his wife divorced him. I've seen it happen time and time again. And I'll just give you a little warning out there. If you're part of Wycliffe Bible Translators, you better watch it. God's wrath is going to come down. And he is going to he is going to destroy. He's going to pound that organization into the ground. And I pray for it to happen. I hope God makes an example out of Wycliffe Bible translators and uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics and Frontiers. Couldn't think of the other one off the top of my head. I pray God stops them dead in their tracks. So that's going to be it for this study. 
again. King James onlyism has been vindicated yet again. I have been warning, others have been warning for many years now about this tide of the new versions as they become more and more sodomite friendly, more and more feminist friendly, and now they're starting to go to the other cults out there like Islam. And they already are linked up with the Catholic Church. Already the Roman Catholic Church recommends a lot of these new versions. In fact, I heard recently that their most preferred new version, the Roman Catholic best version that they like the most, is actually the New Revised Standard Version. And I have one out there in my office. It's in my Real Bible Version Issue Exposed video. I have one. It's a New Revised Standard Version Catholic Youth Edition. And in that thing, they actually say that you are to take the Eucharist. Christians were killed, you know, burned at the stake for not doing that back during the Reformation years. But this Bible, this new version, says that you're to take the Eucharist and, and then you'll have eternal life. I mean, it just teaches Roman Catholic doctrine right in it. And they've gone, the new versions have yoked up with the Roman Catholic Church, and now they're getting even worse. Now they're going over to Islam. That's the tide of these new versions. Now, if you're for them, if you're for versions like the NIV or the New American Standard Version or even the New King James, any of these new versions, any Bible produced since 1881, they all are yoked up to the Catholic Church and they are all going with this tide of apostasy. They're getting worse and worse. You see, the King James Bible, when it first came out in 1611, a lot of the spellings were not standardized yet. You had uh, things were different there, the font of the original 1611 was a little bit different. It was a Gothic font as opposed to the Roman font that we use today. So there were updatings and changes, and the King James Bible was purified from the period of 1611 to 1769, mainly because the English language itself was being purified. It wasn't that there were lots of mistakes in 1611. The English language itself was reaching its pinnacle. So the King James Bible over the years became pure and pure and pure. There was a purification process. These new versions, it's the exact opposite. The new versions, you go back to 1881, the revised version, and the 1901 American Standard Version, they read somewhat similar to a King James Bible. But now as the years go by, they become more and more and more perverse, and you have these new versions like The Message and others like that, and they don't even read anything like a Bible. And people say, well, you know, I think that you have to have multiple, lots of different versions. Then you have confusion. Then you have Satan's statement of, yea, hath God said. You question the word of God, and then you stand up and you pretend that you have the word of God in a book that you hold in your hands, when in reality you don't believe it. That's the problem with new version philosophy, Alexandrian philosophy. That's why a lot of people don't like my ministry, because I expose them. You see, when I stand up and I preach out of this King James Bible that I'm holding in my hands right now, I call it God's Word because I believe it's God's Word. I believe this book is perfect. I believe there aren't any errors in it. So I'm not a hypocrite, like a lot of you are that use the new versions and, and attack the King James Bible. If you're ignorant of this subject, you need to study it. If you're not ignorant of the subject and you use the new versions and you defend the new versions and you attack the King James Bible, you are quite ignorant. I'm going to tell you that. You are very much deceived and God cannot use you. Your stand is a stand of a hypocrite. You stand up there and you tell people that you have the word of God and you don't believe it for one second. You don't believe that the book that you hold in front of you is perfect. That makes you a hypocrite. That makes you a liar. If you're a new versionist. Oh, I'm very offended at what you're saying. Good. Maybe it'll convict you a little bit and you'll think about your stand that you have been led into believing. Maybe you'll realize the fact that the lost world laughs at you. Okay? Just incredible. Get back to the King James Bible. That's the only way we can have unity as Christians. So that's going to be it for this morning. Or not this morning, this evening. Uh, so thank you for listening.